In the southwestern hills of West Virginia, one of the oldest continuously operating glass factories still exists. Production is not made by machine, but instead by men, hand forming each individual piece. Lanco Glass, located in Milton, West Virginia, designs, creates, and produces production glass as it did since 1921. While Blanco is sold around the world, here in the visitor center, customers may see, feel, touch and purchase the most current items available. Color is one of the magic facets of Blanco glass. Other glass companies boast of the virtues of clearer or crystal glass. Blanco produces crystal along with hundreds of vibrant and glowing colored glass. From the trademark Blanco water bottle, pitchers, decanters of all shapes and sizes, vases, drinking glasses, and even dishes, many other items are made by Blanco. These are the products from the magic of Blanco. Come behind the scenes into the factory to see what it takes to produce these items. Behind the visitor center, come now for the first time to see how this glass is made by the people that make it from beginning to end. That's half of our dial color palette right now. All those different colors. And then this is the other half. A lot of the colors has been made through over a period of 40 years. Uh, a lot of it was um, on purpose as far as um, adding the color and trying to get a color, a specific color for a customer. And some of them were made just through recycling tableware collet in order to make something that's sellable and um, recycle uh, the uh, glass collet to keep our collet uh, from building. That was the two pallets of the dial collars, these are the sheet glass collars. We have uh, four pallets, four racks of those. You can see traces of each chemical in those collars. Um, the nickel makes the brown collar, nickel flushes. Uh, there's manganese iron flushes. Um, you can actually tell a difference in the the collar as to what chemicals is in there to make that collar. If you've got this collar in this thickness of a piece of glass here, if you wanted to produce the same the same collar in this thickness, then your amount of chemicals would be approximately seven times less in this for the same collar as this, due to the thickness. And we have record books that date back. These record books here, I got 63 through 65 in there. And then when you go back to reference it, it kind of helps you to judge as to which formulas are usable and which ones are bogus that you won't be able to reuse. This is the mixing room. This is where all of the raw materials are stored. This is also where they will all be blended together. The raw materials will be weighed in accordance with the precise and proper recipe. Then they will be dumped into a hopper. When the mixer is turned on, the materials will be transported from the hopper into the mixer to be evenly blended.
quite often it is asked, how critical really are these components? Very critical. As you will see in this abbreviated mixing process, Scott measures, remeasures, and sometimes even removes fractional amounts of the components before dumping the entire mix into the hopper. These materials are for crystal or clear glass. That's the base for all the other glass. Depending upon what is scheduled, this mix could be ruby, topaz, azure, violet, jungle, lavender, or any other number of colors. Mixing the color will be one of the last steps you will see in making a batch, but still a long, long way from being ready to work into a finished item. Remember, Blanco glass is made by men and not by machines. Everything being done in this mixing room, all the products being added to make the final blend to make the glass, is all being done by a human. No machines are used in making Blanco glass. We have our sand, our sodi ash, our limestone, uh, borax potash, nitre, feldspar, barium mixture. Um, we'll empty it all into the hopper. We'll auger it into the mixer, mixer it approximately three minutes, and dump it out in the buggy. And then I'll lay out the colorants and stir the colorants in on top of it. batch is most of the way made. It's been taken out of the mixer and into the batch buggy. But remember, this is still crystal, clear glass. Now it has to have colorant added to it. And to do that, first we have to mix the color. So we're going to go into the colorant room and mix that color. Your uh, manganese is what we use um, for a wide range of pinks all the way to amethyst. Um, we use it also uh, with combination with the cupric for our tableware, uh, we call it tableware cobalt. It's actually a daylight blue. Um, with selenium is your main contributor color for your red ruby. Um, it, in combination with uh, cadmium sulfur, makes it strike and will uh, turn the glass red. This is the red, actual red coloring. 
Uh, nickel oxide is basically it's a brown. Uh, we use it for various flushes and darkening agent in um, say ebony or some of the other darker colors. Powder blue is basically the same thing as cobalt. It's just a diluted form to where we can control where cobalt is so strong. Um, sulfur is has no colorant uh, effect by itself, but used in combination with sugar, uh, it makes our ambers. And of course, red iron oxide is a yellowish green color, and we use it, like I said, in, with manganese and some of the other colorants for various fleshes, the grays, and the greens. After, after the batch is made, the colorants are stirred on it and the glass uh, that needs to be added onto the batch um, is done. Um, it's up to the night watchman to finish cleaning out the furnace and to start charging the furnace. And that'll be done in two charges, usually four hours apart. Most tanks is anywhere from uh, 15 to 17 hours, pots are 24 to 36 hours. Uh, a melt cycle, then uh, the, it's up to the, the watchman to cut the furnace, bring it back down to table where it's work temperature, and uh, basically get it ready for to be worked again. The process for uh, cleaning out a furnace, uh, we usually uh, find us a uh, barrel that will hold water, fill it up approximately a foot and ladle the glass out with a uh, glass ladle and put it in the water which makes it break up easy so later on we can either dispose of it or recycle it whichever we may be just making a color change in that furnace and not that there was anything wrong with the glass and um, he just basically ladles it out until there's it's clean there's no glass left in it uh, sometimes we'll put the stopper back up, let the glass run off the walls, uh, then go back and scrape it out again and try to limit the uh, amount of uh, carryover from one chemical to the next colorant so that uh, we get the uh, color that we're shooting for. Come here, I used to work an asphalt. The reason why the heat don't bother me that much here. It bothers me sometimes, but not that much. I'm cleaning out the tank so because it's going to a different collar and it's got to be cleaned out because the chemicals do not mix and it might change the collar of the of the glass and if it's not cleaned out, uh, it, it'll change the collar of it and it won't be no good. It'll have to do it all over again. And it costs a lot, of, a lot more money than doing the right star with. With the tank cleaned out, it's now time for Carson to start the recharge. We recharge the furnace. By recharging the furnace, we take the uh, batch, it's in the batch buggy, and we shovel it into the furnace to recharge it. A little bit of uh, violet color back on top of it. Uh, use. Uh, Call it helps uh, recycle, of course, to an extent with what we've got, and it also helps the batch because it layers the, the solid, the glass, through it actually helps it melt down faster, clean out quicker. If it's got some call it back on it versus straight batch, you just gotta watch and not get uh, 
case call it mixed in with it because it's got of course got crystal in it it'll make the melt go lighter change the color for instance amethyst and orchid um, celery is a case color from jungle um, emerald and antique green antique green is of course made with a green ball covered with crystal it's just to, to make a lighter shade of the same color it's the way uh, tableware can produce two different colors with uh, one melt of glass the pod itself holds about 750 pound batch of glass and sand and uh, the buggies hold uh, probably anywhere from 3 to 350 100 pounds of glass and uh, the melt cycle is anywhere from uh, well we recharge them at every four hours when it's charging time and uh, it takes them anywhere according to the color of them anywhere from uh, 24 to 36 hours for it to cook out to be done enough to work. On a tank out of this field, number six, the melt temperature on it is 2,570 degrees. I try to go down here and turn the gas temperature up so uh, it will raise up 2,570 so it'll melt the glass so we, it'll finish it so we can make a product. After it melts out in about 36 hours, we come back, we turn it down to hold temperature, which is 2,500 degrees. And so they can make the product out of the, the glass. Just a hot job. <laughs> but I enjoy it. I enjoy it. The first time I ever heard the term night watchman, I naturally assumed security guard. But the two terms couldn't be more different. A night watchman has a very critical job. Not only does he have to clean out and recharge the tanks, he has to adjust the furnaces and he has to oversee all the critical melt cycles. By doing that he has to take readings of all the furnaces from gauges spread completely around the factory. He has to monitor the status of the melting glass and readjust the furnaces so that the color doesn't burn out. If he allows that to happen, the next day when the glass blowers come in to do their job, the glass will be no good and it will be a huge waste of money for the factory. On this one, it's reading high, so I have to turn it down. And we'll check this one to see if it's done yet. I'm going to check and make sure the glass is secure enough for them to, to use. I'm going to approximately estimate the time what it's going to be till it to be done enough for them to use it in their product without it messing the glass up. I take and drop the stopper. I stick the, the rod in the glass and pull it out, make sure it's clear, make sure there ain't no seeds, no air bubbles or anything in it so we can uh, use it for our product. We have seeds in this glass. It's not done in approximately three to four hours it will be done for the, the use of the product. We're gonna check this one. I'm sure it's not ready yet. This is a hot one. Approximately four to 
four to five hours, this one will be done. On uh, the crystal and the violet, we've got approximately another hour to two hours. They'll be ready to work for the guys to come in and do their product out of. They'll be uh, clear, no seeds or anything. They'll be ready to work. The glass has finally gone through its melt cycle. Now the gatherer will bring over on the end of a blowpipe a large wad of glass. It's glowing hot at about 2300 degrees. It's handed off to Shorty Finley, the glass blower. He will now form it into a beautiful piece of Blanco glass. Try and guess what it's going to be, and I bet you you can't, because it'll go through so many twists and turns through the way, you're going to think you know what it is, and just when you do, it changes shape altogether again. Glass blowers use a number of different tools. Typically they're made of wood, and they keep plenty of water nearby. They have to keep the tools cool because at 2300 degrees, that glass can actually catch the tool on fire. While all tools are important to the glass blower, the most important one is the blowpipe. Shorty actually blows air down into the glob of glass. This expands the glass so that he can form it further into the shape that he desires. The glass blower must maintain positive pressure on the blowpipe at all times while blowing into the glass. Should he reduce the pressure, the superheated air will race back up into his mouth and lungs. Working with the glass as long as he can, he'll continue to form it with other tools as he needs to for the job that he's working on. Remember, at all times this glass is cooling, getting more and more difficult to work. He'll blow into it, he'll shape it, he'll form it as best he can but eventually it ends up back in the fire to become malleable once again to continue working on the job. In the center of the shop there's a common or community furnace. Shorty is now placing his work into what is called the glory hole. This is where he'll reheat the part that he's working on, getting it up to an achieved temperature where he can work it again and make it malleable. Only years of experience from a glass blower give him the knowledge to know how long that product has to stay inside that glory hole. Watch carefully in the background. There's a man that's placing a pipe into one of the tanks. In a second, he's going to pull that pipe out and he's going to bring it over to Shorty. He's going to take some hot glass and they're going to place it on the bottom of the project that Shorty's working on as another attachment that goes on this piece. In what becomes a two-stage process, the gatherer is going to bring another piece of glass over to Shorty, similar to the first one. You will now see it from a different angle how it was applied.
This piece of glass will end up becoming a foot. You'll recognize it very quickly as Shorty works deftly with the tool to flatten and smooth it out. This would be the base for a vase, a bowl, or a goblet. Watch carefully as this is formed. Remember, all of these jobs are done by men, not machines, by the feel of fingertips and years of experience. This is done the old style way, the way glass has been formed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Shorty's job is all but done. Now the stick up comes and applies a softly molten piece of glass to the foot of the project that Shorty's been working on. Shorty makes sure that it's attached securely now he must remove his project from the end of his blowpipe. The stick up will then take that project over to the glory hole where it will be reheated and handed off to the finisher for the next step in completing the job. Shorty will continue to work at his workstation producing the exact same part over and over again until all the orders are complete for that job. While Shorty was attaching the foot, the part cooled down substantially. This is where the stick-up has to patiently reheat the part so that the finisher will be able to work it. It takes a few minutes to get it back up to temperature. Here the stick up passes the project off to the finisher. Notice the finisher is using a similar tool as Shorty did, but for a completely different use. And now he trims the molten glass, which is more like clay, to finish off the top edge. Molten glass is now being delivered to the finisher. As Shorty did, he will guide the glass over and then take the molten glob of glass and put it around the top and then down the sides in a decorative fashion. We don't know what color it is, but rest assured it must be a different color from the original part. Back to the glory hole for one final reheating. After it's turned red hot, the finisher will hand form the rest of the project. Notice the natural tools that the finisher uses. He uses centrifugal force and gravity to form the part. Sure, he'll use hand forming at the end, but look how he flared out the original part into a large bowl, and now he'll finish the job using his wood tools again. Earlier I mentioned that Shorty would be working on the same project over and over again until the orders were complete. If you watch behind the finisher, you're going to see Shorty come up behind with the exact same job going into the glory hole. There he is now. This piece is now finished. The carrion will now take it off the end of the blowpipe. The blowpipe is tapped to release it. Once it is broken free, there is a little nub on the bottom of the bowl. That's called a pontal. That's the point where the blowpipe was connected. The carrion will take a torch and warm that to soften the edges so they're not sharp. Then he will place it into the leer and the bowl will take a four hour trip in the annealing oven from one end of the shop to the other, stepping down the temperature all the way so it doesn't shatter. 
At the end of the Lear, jobs that were put in four hours ago are now coming out the other end. They've been progressively stepped down in temperature so that the glass wouldn't shatter as it came through. Today we have Terry from the Blanco Collector Society actually operating at the Lear. Normally there's a professional there, but Blanco was kind enough to allow her to apply the Blanco stickers onto these head vases. She's decided on a place for the first one and looks at it to make sure it looks okay. She now moves on to the second one. All Blanco pieces get the Blanco sticker. This is a very important final decoration that goes on all items coming out of the Blanco Lear. After that job is complete, they must now come over to the sand blaster. She'll place it on top of the sand blaster, two quick blasts, and that job is done also. Her job is done here, placing them in the bin, and walks away. I've been here for five years, and I've had my ups and downs here, but I enjoy it. I enjoy what I'm doing now. I've worked on the shops. I've worked in shipping. I've worked in antique. I've worked in grinding. I'm a watchman now, and I enjoy what I'm doing. Sometimes it gets a little hard and rough, but you got your fun times and your bad times. I like it. But I really do. I like it here.